Welcome back to the second part of this lecture on the Buddhist arts of Korea, in which I will discuss Buddhist artworks from the late Goryeo and Joseon periods. This lecture revolves around two key questions. What fears did people have in pre-modern Korea? And how were these fears addressed in Buddhist art? First of all, people had fears related to death. They asked themselves, what happens to me and my loved ones after we die? In pre-modern Korea, most people believed in rebirth. They believed that all beings are born, live, die, and are then born again, indefinitely. You may have heard the term nirvana before. And nirvana basically means that one is released from the suffering of rebirth, being you know, reborn again and again. So nirvana means not being reborn again. But not everyone was able to achieve nirvana in his or her lifetime. So Buddhist believers came up with an alternative plan. If they were going to be reborn again anyway, then they wanted to make sure that they are reborn into the best possible path of rebirth. And there are six of such possible paths, three good ones and three bad ones. The good ones include the realm of devas, demigods and humans. While the bad ones consist of the realms of animals, hungry ghosts, and hells. So what Goryeo and Joseon Koreans feared the most was rebirth in the bad realms of hells, animals, and hungry ghosts, since this would involve a lot of suffering. On this slide, you see a detail from a Goryeo period illuminated Avatamsaka Sutra dating from the 14th century. This work contains one of the earliest Korean depictions of the six realms of rebirth. In the innermost circle, highlighted in green, the artist depicted a seated Buddha, below of which you see the so-called three poisons that keep the wheel of rebirth turning. A rooster, symbolizing greed, a snake, representing anger, and a pig, representing ignorance, or hate. In the next circle, highlighted in red, we find illustrations of the six realms of rebirth. At the top are the three good ones, vaguely defined here as a heavenly realm. And the three bad ones, depicted at the bottom of the circle, are illustrated in much greater detail. The realm of the hells is in the middle, represented by a boiling cauldron, the realm of the animals is on the right, and hungry ghosts on the left. So people ask themselves, how can we make sure that we and members of our family are reborn into a better realm of rebirth? One measure was to gain merit by commissioning Buddhist artworks and performing Buddhist rituals. Some of these artworks and rituals were geared towards a specific group of Buddhist divinities, the Ten Kings of the Underworld. Koreans believed, and some Koreans still believe, that a dead person encounters ten kings while going through a transitional state between death and rebirth. This time, in which the ultimate realm of rebirth has not yet been decided, presents a window of opportunity for the family members of the deceased. They can use this time to commission rituals to help the, the, the um, transitional being towards a more sanitary rebirth. These rituals take place once every week for the first 49 days after someone's death. The photograph on this slide exemplifies the various types of food offerings on the occasion of a modern ritual held on the 49th day after someone's death. In this case, the ritual was conducted at Yuhasa in Andong for an eminent monk named Myoheng, whose portrait we see featured on the top of the altar, highlighted with a yellow circle. After the Sashib Kuje ritual, 
there were three more rituals. The ritual after 100 days, one year, and three years after someone's death. Each of these 10 rituals addressed one of the 10 kings of the underworld. The idea that there are 10 kings ruling over the underworld is actually a Chinese invention. The Chinese imagined a bureaucracy of hell based on the structure of the secular Chinese bureaucracy of the late Tang. So around the late Tang, that is the late 8th, 9th century, they came up with the idea that the underworld has 10 courts, each ruled by a king. And they imagined that after death, everyone would go from court to court for three years and be judged by the 10 kings before being reborn into one of the six realms of rebirth. Images of the 10 kings appear in China from around the 9th century onward. The scripture on the Ten King Scroll, of which you see a detail in the slide, dates from the 10th century. It includes illustrations of the Ten Kings sitting behind desks, discussing the verdict um, with their attendants while looking at scenes of torture. It is in fact the scripture on the Ten Kings and other apocryphal texts, such as the Sutra on the Eighteen Hells, that inform us about the ways in which Lei Tang Chinese pictured the trials administered by the Ten Kings and how the Chinese imagined how purgatory or what hells um, would look like. Soon thereafter, faith in the Ten Kings arrived in Goryeo, Korea, where the foundation of Xiwangsa or Ten Kings Monastery around the late 10th, early 11th century reveals the rise in popularity of Ten Kings worship in Korea. And from the late Goryeo until the late Joseon period, Ten Kings worship was a prominent feature of Korean Buddhist practice. The biggest fear people had in the late Goryeo and Joseon was that they would meet the Ten Kings and receive an unfavorable verdict on their rebirth. Remember, in the first part of this lecture, I mentioned the story of Wang Nang, who appeared in his wife's dream and instructed her to worship Amitabha. Praying to Amitabha actually provides a shortcut to a good rebirth. It increases the likelihood of not going through the course of the Ten Kings, skipping purgatory altogether, and being reborn into Amitabha's pure land right after one's death. And this is probably what happened to Wang Nang's wife. However, what happens to those who did not have an Amitabha painting in their home like Wang Nang's wife? One could never be 100% sure about one's fate. There was always a chance that one could be reborn in the realm of hell. So, people pray to the Ten Kings, assuming that after death, basically, Everyone will go through purgatory and be judged by the Ten Kings. So as a precautionary measure, people pray to the Ten Kings and what they needed for their prayers and rituals were icons of worship in the form of paintings and sculptures of the Ten Kings. And here's an example for such an icon of Ten King worship. This is a painting depicting the fourth king that is now in the collection of the Cleveland Museum of Art. Considering its small size, it might have been a painting that a 14th century wealthy Buddhist devotee hung in his or her private shrine together with small paintings of the other nine kings. Let's take a deeper look at the composition of this image, which can be divided into an upper and a lower portion. The upper portion represents the realm of justice, featuring the fourth king seated in a prominent armchair behind a desk. The lower portion of the painting depicts the realm of torture and punishment. This compositional structure is reminiscent of the scenes we saw earlier in the 10th century Chinese scroll of the Ten King scripture. The painter of this Goryeo painting emphasizes three lines of action. The king's intense gaze at us, the viewers, with his right eye. 
and his look at the torture scene below him with his left eye, thereby acting as a visual intermediary between us and the hell scene, forcing us to look more closely at what's going on below him. In the realm of torture, we have two scenes of action. A hell warden with a menacing grimace, piercing one of these sinners with his spear, with blood gushing out of the sinner's body. It's quite a graphic depiction, isn't it? And as a side stage, we see a person standing in a boiling cauldron, pleading to the king for mercy while holding his, pran his hands in prayer. The painting on this slide dates from late Joseon, Korea. Like the painting in the previous slide, it depicts the fourth king of the underworld. It can be similarly divided into a realm of justice and a realm of torture and punishment. While the subject matter is basically the same, there are quite a few stylistic and compositional differences. Not for example, the architectural setting of the king's court with its tiled roof structure and a balustrade framing the scene. A folding screen behind the king's high-backed chair further enhances the king's authority and folding screens which enhance the authority of the sitter were in fact widely used at the Joseon royal court as well as in Joseon aristocrats' homes. Also note that this painting features many more figures of officials than the Goryeo painting of the fourth king we just looked at. In order to help the king with his verdict, they recorded the deeds of sinners and functioned as messengers delivering these records to their king. Such an emphasis on the bureaucratic process of writing and record making might be a reflection of the social realities of Lechos on Korea. Also note that on the lower right we see the depiction of Kshiti Karba, a bodhisattva, recognizable by his shaved head and ringed staff. Kshiti Karba Bodhisattva vowed to save all beings from hell, and so the painters perhaps added him to the realm of torture to remind viewers of the potential of salvation from the hells if they pray to Kshiti Garba. What we just did is something that art historians frequently do, a comparative stylistic analysis. We compare two paintings with the same subject matter, one from 14th and one from 18th century Korea. Their basic composition is quite similar. Both have a two-level composition and hieratic scale is clearly noticeable in the depiction of the king versus his officials, hell wardens, people being tortured, etc. A clear difference can be seen in the king's direct gaze towards the viewer in the Goryeo painting versus the king's averted gaze in the Joseon painting. A stylized cloud pattern in the Joseon painting visually enforces the separation between the king's court and the torture scene. In contrast to the Goryeo painting, the Joseon painting is also densely packed with figures. And this is actually a characteristic feature of late Joseon period Buddhist painting, in which we generally see a larger number of depicted figures than in late Goryeo Buddhist painting. What's really interesting about the 18th century painting is the setting. While the background is left blank in the Goryeo painting, the Joseon painting features architectural elements such as the roof or the balustrade. We see such elements appear in Ten Kings of Hell depictions as early as Southern Song, China, when such paintings were made in Mingzhou, present-day Ningbo, and exported to other countries such as Goryeo, Korea. Although not directly related to Southern Song painting, we see the pictorial tradition of Southern Song Ningbo painters still reverberate in this late Joseon picture. And in terms of the visual narrative, the Goryeo painting highlights punishment and torture, while the Joseon painting emphasizes the bureaucratic process leading to the king's verdict, as well as the notion of hope for salvation from the hells. Late Joseon depictions of the kings of the underworld and torture scenes were enshrined in temple halls such as this one, the Myeongbujeon or the Hall of Postmortem Precincts at Cheongdeungsa in Incheon. It is in this kind of spatial context 
in which ten kings worship occurred in late Joseon Korea. A sculpture of the Bodhisattva Kshiti Karaba, highlighted here with a yellow circle, is the central icon in this hall. He is surrounded by sculptures and paintings of the ten kings. Children of recently deceased mothers, fathers, or ancestors would visit such a hall to pray to Kshiti Karaba and the ten kings on behalf of their dead family members. And it is also in such shrines where Buddhist monks would perform rituals commissioned by grieving family members. Now, think about the psychological effects of such scenes of judgment and torture. King Yama, the fifth king, even used a so-called karma mirror, which a deceased would be forced to look at to see his past bad deeds. In the case depicted here, the man had apparently killed an ox. An official, holding a long scroll in his hands, is duly recording these bad deeds. The continuing enshrinement of paintings depicting such torture scenes had two effects. First, these scenes reminded temple visitors that they will be rewarded or punished for their disworldly actions once they die. So the paintings functioned as a moral reminder to do good. Secondly, torture scenes also evoked feelings of guilt in the children of the deceased, convincing them to make offerings for their ancestors. If we look at these effects from an economic perspective, we note that rituals dedicated to the Ten Kings and Kshiti Karaba provided a constant stream of revenue. And indeed, they are the most important and largest source of revenue for Korean Buddhist temples even today. Other fears that affected people in pre-modern Korea are related to ghosts and spirits. People feared that they might be reborn as hungry ghosts or that their ancestors had been reborn as hungry ghosts. They also feared that harmful spirits who died a premature death and were wandering around in the world of the living and caused misfortune, epidemics, and disasters. Now, why were hungry ghosts considered unlucky creatures? In this detail from a nectar ritual painting, you can see a group of hungry ghosts. Some of them are holding up their bowls, begging for food. Hungry ghosts are called hungry ghosts because they had such tiny necks, highlighted here in yellow, that they were unable to eat anything. So they were constantly starving. It is only during Buddhist ceremonies dedicated to them that they were able to partake in the ceremonial offerings. As you can see in the lower part of this detail, some of the hungry ghosts um, apparently had received food from an offering in their bowls and they are happily eating it. People were also afraid of vengeful spirits of people who died prematurely and there were many ways in which one could die prematurely in pre-modern Korea. For example, one could be trampled to death by one's horse or be shot by an arrow during times of war and turmoil. And one could be attacked and killed by a tiger. Wild tigers were a real threat in pre-modern Korea when hundreds of people were killed by tigers every year. These scenes of hungry ghosts and scenes of premature death come from a particular type of painting commonly referred to as nectar ritual painting, kam no teng, which began to emerge in Korea from around the 16th century onward. The term nectar ritual refers to a cluster of rituals that offered nectar, gamno, or um, relief to, to ghosts and spirits. These rituals became increasingly popular in the latter half of the Joseon period. For example, nectar ritual paintings were used in rituals during the Festival of Hungry Ghosts, which was held every year in the summer and was dedicated to seven generations of living and deceased ancestors. Nectar ritual paintings were also used in the seven times seven rites, that is the funerary rites as discussed earlier in this talk, and they were used during the Water Land Assembly, which was one of the largest outdoor ceremonies that 
lasted for days and in which a multitude of rituals were conducted. The Waterland Assembly culminated in a final ritual dedicated to the unfortunate, hungry spirits who don't have any relatives who could hold rituals for them. Patrons who commissioned such rituals prayed that they and their ancestors and all other sentient beings may be safely guided to Amitabha's pure land. A prominent, uniquely Korean feature of nectar ritual paintings is their composition. We find paintings illustrating the feeding of hungry ghosts in China and Japan as well, but it is only in Korea where we see paintings with a standardized tripartite structure consisting of a heavenly realm and a human realm with a ritual stage and scenes of potential deaths. The fact that we find this type of painting only in late Joseon Korea tells us that there must have been significant changes in Buddhist ritual culture going on at that time, which necessitated the creation of nectar ritual paintings to accommodate Buddhist devotees' ritual needs. Before ending this talk, I would like to invite you to take a closer look at this mid-18th century nectar ritual painting from the collection of the Peabody Essex Museum. Measuring 6.5 feet in height and 7.7 .7 feet in width, this painting was once used in large outdoor rituals such as the aforementioned Waterland Assembly and enshrined in the main hall of a large Buddhist temple in Korea. Now, if you like, feel free to pause this video for a minute or two and look at this painting more closely. Test your analytical skills. Check if you can identify different groups of figures from the Buddhist pantheon. Notice the hieratic scale and layers of sanctity. Now let's examine this painting together. Let's see how the artist structured the visual narrative of this painting. The lower half features the human world, the secular world, with various small scenes of potential death laid out in a panoramic fashion separated by contours of cloud patterns. But what the painters really emphasize by placing it at the center of this painting is an actual ritual stage of a ceremony dedicated to the hungry ghosts. The upper half of the painting features a group of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas standing on a band of colorful cloud formations rendered in shades of pastel red and green which visually separates them from the human realm. The upper portion of this slide shows the entire Nectar Orator painting, in which I highlighted the ritual stage in the center of the composition. And in the lower portion of the slide, you can see a detail of the ritual stage. Nectar ritual paintings, such as this one, basically allow us to observe the ways in which rituals for the hungry ghosts were performed in late Joseon Korea. In the lower left, you can see an eminent monk seated in a chair. He is most likely the abbot of the temple and the main person in charge of the ritual. Behind him are several monks standing, holding musical instruments such as cymbals or a large drum. The abbot is chanting, chanting spells and forming mudras, thereby inviting the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to descend from the heavenly realm and partake in the ritual. A large altar table predominates the center of the composition. In front of this altar table, we see a hungry ghost with bulging eyes, fiery red hair and scarves fluttering in the wind as a representative figure for all suffering beings. Kneeling down with his hands in Anjali Mudra, he is patiently waiting for the food offerings to be activated by the Buddha so he can eat them. To the right of the hungry ghosts, the painters depicted a row of seated figures. These are nuns, recognizable by their headgear, and monks, a few monks, who attended the ritual but were not actively involved in it. So, speaking of hieratic scale, they are depicted in much smaller size than the monks in the lower left who were actually the ones conducting the ritual. At the bottom left, you can also see three figures 
wearing moss green clothes. Who do you think do these figures represent? These three figures represent mourners wearing traditional Korean mourning hats and clothes made from coarse hemp cloth. The painters captured the moment in which these mourners make full prostrations in front of the altar, praying to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas for their deceased ancestors' rebirth in Amitabha's pure land and for the salvation of all sentient beings, including hungry ghosts. So this nectar ritual painting conveys the message that all sentient beings are caught in the wheel of rebirth, but the living can hold rituals for the deceased so that several Buddhas such as Amitabha and Bodhisattvas such as Chitigarbha may lead them out of the cycle of rebirth. We have reached the end of this lecture in which you learned about late Goryeo and Joseon period Buddhist paintings such as the Ten Kings of the Underworld paintings and Nectar Ritual paintings. You also learned how such paintings were used in Buddhist rituals that addressed people's most inner fears such as the idea of being reborn in the bad realms of hells and hungry ghosts and the idea that there were vengeful spirits lingering in our world that could suffer um, and also cause suffering and harm to us. The solution to overcome these anxieties and fears was to conduct rituals for feeding the hungry ghosts and to pray to the ten kings for rebirth in a good realm such as Amitabha's pure land um, for oneself, one's family members and all sentient beings. And this is the end of the second part of this lecture. Thank you so much for watching.